So it is a real pleasure to take to, to talk today from my home college farm. The Latin tag means beautiful shape. Shape dynamics is attracting increasing interest and some remarkable possibilities have recently been recognized in discussions with a growing number of collaborators. I hope they are all listed here. If they match nature, the theory's principles and some of the suggestions I base on them have radical implications. We have mostly used the Newtonian n-body problem to develop new ideas and to explore what the Big Bang might be like. We doubt whether general relativity based on space-time symmetry gives an accurate picture. We recast Einstein's theory, making spatial symmetry fundamental and time a succession of spatial structures. Flavio Mercati's book gives much background detail about the shape dynamic treatment of both particles and the geometry coupled to matter fields. What much of what I'm going to say builds on what is in Flavio's book. Here are some bullet points. Shape dynamics recasts and unifies physics and cosmology as a relational theory of dynamically closed universes. Shapes defined by pure numbers are fundamental. That's new, I believe. Particles in space define the simplest shapes and illustrate the principles and possibilities. The set of all shapes, shape space, is compact and has an intrinsic probability measure. Its necessary existence is also new and has remarkable statistical implications. The theory's primary invariant, the complexity, has multiple properties and interpretations, some completely unexpected. It might even be time. If so, time begins but never ends. Leibniz said space is the order of coexisting things. Time, the succession of coexisting things. Mach said relative motions are alone determinable and time is an abstraction deduced from the changes of things. Increase of all the world's dimensions a thousand fold, says Poincaré, it still remains similar to itself. Minkowski either ignored or did not know these comments. His space time is void and makes time almost identical to space. Mach inspired Einstein, but Minkowski's space time is still the glue that locally holds the world together in general relativity. Shape dynamics creates the glue using shapes defined by real things. Please note the comment made by none other Paul Dirac. He came close to transforming general relativity into shape dynamics in 1959. Velocities are ill-begotten. Only dimensionless ratios, use, which are used exclusively in shape dynamics, have physical meaning. Observationally, the universe is not expanding, but changing its shape. Insistence on ratios seems minor, even obvious, but it is transformative. Angles as fractions of, the, of two pi, thus fractions of a full circle, are the foundation of shape dynamics. Taking ratios seriously as the basis of all observations highlights a questionable aspect of theoretical cosmology. 
The universe is said to be expanding, but the only thing cosmologists can observe are things like redshifts, which are ratios. They observe differences of redshifts, not differences of distances, which expansion of the universe seems to imply. This next slide aims to establish a better conceptual framework for thinking about a changing universe and what might be wrong with the present theory. N particles have a configuration space of three N dimensions in which three coordinates locate the center of mass, three fix an orientation, and one the overall size. These seven are absolute, or as Leibniz would say, extrinsic. The intrinsic background independent shape depends on only 3n minus seven numbers. The space of possible shapes, shape space, is the quotient of the configuration space with respect to the similarity group. We will see that quotienting by spatial scale is what really counts. I think it could transform both physics and cosmology. Projection of general Newtonian solutions to shape space eliminates all redundant information and destroys none that is essential. History is represented as an unparametrized succession of shapes that by time reversal symmetry carries no Newtonian absolute direction. The intrinsic degrees of freedom in shape space are the 3n minus seven that define a shape and the 3n minus eight that define a direction. The simplest, most predictive, and most natural evolution law of a universe in its shape space is geodesic, for which the Cauchy data will be an initial shape and a direction at it. That's a test a relational theory of the universe should pass. Newtonian theory does not. This is because general n-body solutions projected to shape space require five additional non-geodesic degrees of freedom. They are extrinsic. According to what is known as the velocity decomposition theorem, the kinetic energy decomposes at any instant into the amounts in change of shape, rotational energy, and pure dilatational expansion. They yield two dimensionless ratios. The direction of the angular momentum relative to the instantaneous shape gives two more. The fifth is the ratio of the kinetic and potential energies. In shape space, these are all additional degrees of freedom that evolve together with the shape. Their manifestation in subsystems of the universe like the solar system is what justifies the absolute aspects of Newtonian dynamics. However, in a Machian relational universe, the total energy and angular momentum vanish, but there can still be subsystems with all possible energies and angular momenta provided they sum to zero for the complete universe. If we are considering the universe as a whole, as any good relationist must, Machian principles eliminate four of the problematic additional degrees of freedom. What shape dynamics highlights is that to model a universe like ours, in which there is ongoing structure formation. The variable that in Newtonian terms is the ratio of the amount of kinetic energy in overall expansion 
divided by the amount in change of shape must, must be retained. Because it is shape dynamically inexplicable, I call it the anomaly or the creation measure, because without it, nothing interesting could happen in a classical universe. I said insistence on ratios seems minor. I don't think it is. It may reveal the secret of the universe. Let us see if we can find where it hides. The orbit in its configuration space of a Newtonian system with fixed energy E can be found as a geodesic by extremalizing the action of Jacobi's principle. Lambda is an arbitrary monotonic parameter. Cap E is the total energy and appears as a constant on an equal footing with the potential energy. The reparametrization invariance of the action makes the principle Jacobi proposed timeless. In fact, his aim was not to eliminate time, but merely to correct a mathematical inconsistency in the form of the principle of least action that Euler and Lagrange had developed. However, inspired by Mach, you could, as in fact I did, hit unknowingly on that form of the action to create a timeless theory of the universe. The intuition that both time and motion are relational does lead rather naturally to equations with the form that one needs. The recovery of time and clocks in the form in which we know and use them is described in my archive paper, The Nature of Time, and in Flavio's book. Complete elimination of the superficial resemblance to time through the use of a curve parameter lambda leads to Jacobi's own parameter-free form shown here in the slide for the n-body problem with vanishing energy and angular momentum and the explicit form of the Newton gravitational potential. Faithfully reflecting Mach's aphorisms about both time and motion, it involves only differences of separations between the particles. More important in the search for the secret of the universe, it highlights something that Mach missed, but which Poincaré was close to. With the Newtonian gravitational potential, the Jacobi action is not scale invariant. Look at the length dimensions. The potentials is minus one and does not balance the quadratic terms plus two. The dimension of the action is the square root of a length. It is not scale invariant and is what, in Newtonian terms, allows expansion of the universe. Its size at any instant is nominal, the size of the universe, I mean. But one can say it is now twice as large as it was in an earlier epoch. This is due to the specific structure of the action. There's the same structure in general relativity. There is just one Hamiltonian degree of freedom in the action that is extrinsic from a shape perspective. Another way of seeing this is that in the principle of least action in both Newtonian and Einsteinian gravity, it is necessary to specify a ratio of scales at the two limits of integration of the action. I will now introduce two shape dynamic concepts which hint how our universe creates structure without an extrinsic term in its action. 
Shape space comes with a dowry of two architectonic structures. The first is a relational natural metric. Let the two pairs of not quite identical triangles on the left have the same three particles at their vertices. The differences of their positions in A and B arise from intrinsic changes in the separations between the particles, but also between different extrinsic unobservable displacements in absolute space. The Newtonian action and initial data calculated for them differ for no observable reason, but lead to different observable evolutions. On the right, in contrast, one imagines one triangle held fixed and the other translated, rotated, and changed in size until the Machian action with positive definite radicand is minimized. The resulting quantity is a scale invariant difference of the shapes or the distance between them in shape space. It is a quintessentially relational natural metric obtained by best matching as Bertotti and I developed back in 1982. There's something else as well. The Newtonian configuration space is non-compact because the scale degree of freedom is unbounded. The quotienting with respect to it makes shape space compact then on it, the natural metric defines relative volumes. With them, measures and probabilities are automatically defined, providing a, sure found, a secure foundation for statistics and probability, which Maxwell called the true logic of the world. To my knowledge, no similarly robust foundation for statistical arguments exists in standard cosmology or any of the approaches to quantum gravity. There is something unexpected about the natural metric and its Machian origin. Put in modern group theoretical terms, it was recognized soon after 1900, not by Einstein in fact, that quotienting by rotations would lead to vanishing angular momentum of the universe. That is important and is realized in closed space general relativity. What I now think, as you will see later in my talk, is that the additional quotienting by spatial scale leads to not only a well-defined probability measure, but also to completely unexpected uses of it. Let me also say that already going back to Weil's theory in 1917, there have been many attempts to make a four-dimensionally covariant theory, i.e a scale invariant theory. Although that did lead very importantly to gauge theory, vile type attempts to generalize space time have not yet led to success or anything unexpectedly new. I find it encouraging that spatial as opposed to space time scale invariance does look as if it might as I will explain later in the talk. The second architectonic structure, actually a one parameter family of structures, are subspaces of co-dimension one that the primary invariant of the similarity group defines in shape space. Tim Koslovsky, Flavio Mercati, and I call it the complexity. Mathematically, it is the ratio of the root mean square length and the mean harmonic length. As a ratio, 
it, meet, it meets the shape dynamic goal standard of being a pure number. I'll let you absorb the mass weighted expressions for a moment while I pour out some more water for myself. Note that up to a factor, the numerator is the square root of the center of mass moment of inertia, which is half the trace of the inertia tensor, while the other is, again up to a factor, the inverse of the Newton potential. Thus, the shape complexity is the ratio of the two most fundamental quantities in the Newtonian end body problem. It is a sensitive measure of clustering, especially for a large number of particles, because close approach of two particles has little effect on the root mean square length, but can greatly change the Newton potential, even making it infinite. This creates possibilities we never anticipated. The complexity has a counterpart in closed space general relativity, though its properties have hardly been explored and certainly not in the manner we have started to, to use the complexity in particle dynamics. The complexity has an absolute minimum local minima and saddles. It has no maxica, maxima, only infinite singularities. The sphere you see represents the shapes of the simplest possible relational universe, which consists of three particles. They must always be at the vertices of a triangle whose shape is defined by two internal angles which are pure numbers as required, in, as required in shape dynamics. Each point on the shape sphere represents the shape of a triangle. Chiral partners are at the same longitude and opposite latitudes. Degenerate collinear triangles are on the equator and for equal masses as here, the equilateral triangles are at the poles. The minimum of the complexity shown by the color coding is at the equilateral triangles, whatever the mass is. On the equator, there are three saddles named after Euler who discovered their significance. The contour lines show the one dimensional level sets of the complexity. In this simplest case, the probability measure that the natural metric defines is simply proportional to contour length. I don't think there is anything like shape space in the quantum gravity literature. If, as Leibniz said, space is the order of coexisting things, the complexity of point particles in Euclidean space is the pure number that most directly quantifies the order. It, fill, it fulfills that task in a surprising number of ways. This next slide, we should go on to that one. Thank you, Paula. Lists four roles that the complexity plays even before we come to the one that, if nature works that way, trumps them all. For any number of particles, the complexity always has an absolute minimum that corresponds to the most uniform distribution the particles can possibly have. I introduced the complexity as a measure of clustering. That's much the same as variety. Things that are uniform lack variety and structure. I once read that Leibniz said, variety is reality. If we buy that, the shape with minimum complexity is at the 
absolute zero of variety and with it reality. For a shape now with variety greater than the minimum, the difference is the amount of created reality compared with the absolute minimum. The hint at an analogy with the absolute zero of temperature is not coincidental, though it is subversive. I believe shape dynamics has the potential to invert all normal thermodynamic and statistical mechanical orthodoxy. Next, apart from its sign, the complexity is what n-body specialists call the shape potential or the normalized Newton potential. It is simply the Newton potential made scale invariant, as we have seen, through multiplication by the square root of the moment of inertia, the other key quantity in n-body theory. If the n-body problem is used to model an island universe for which external rulers cannot be employed, the dimensionful gravitational constant disappears and the shape potential replaces the conventional Newton potential as the quantity that governs the evolution. This matches the first principle of shape dynamics. Only pure numbers as ratios of things of the same kind are truly physical in a dynamically isolated universe. The next interpretation of the complexity is a real surprise given Poincaré's comments about the size of the world and that last vestige of the Newtonian absolutes that I mentioned. The complexity is the ratio of the root mean square length, basically the average of the large interparticle lengths, divided by the mean harmonic length, the average of the short lengths. The operational meaning of measurement allows us to say that the latter, the short lengths, measure the former, the long lengths. This means that the complexity is almost paradoxically, the scale invariant intrinsic size of the universe. Every possible shape of the universe proclaims its own size. This makes it all the more puzzling, suspicious, I would say, that in the principle of least action applied to the universe in modern cosmology, we need to specify a ratio of sizes that bears no relation at all to the intrinsic sizes that the two shapes already have. Is there something rotten in the state of cosmology? There's a related interpretation of the complexity. Its inverse is in scare quotes, a scale invariant Planck length. The conventional Planck length inevitably has a value relative to something in the universe. My hand say, its value tells us nothing about the current state of the universe. If instead of my hand, we use the Hubble radius, we obtain a value of the Planck length on cosmological scales. That's better, but it still, still tells us nothing about the detailed structure of the universe, either in the immediate vicinity of my kitchen or out to the Hubble horizon. In contrast, the inverse of the complexity is, primarily the, is the primary characterization of such structure. What's more, its value is encoded directly within a single shape, whereas the determination of the three physical and dimensional constants used to determine the Planck universe units requires a finite interval of time and hence many shapes of the universe. The complexity hints at a unification, 
not of forces, but of foundational concepts in physics and cosmology, as, if, as I will now start to explain. It has long been accepted that entropy puts the direction into time. Shape dynamics suggests that is plain wrong. And moreover, that there is no need to add some special state in the past, something inexplicable within the known laws of physics, a past hypothesis, as David Albert coined it, in order to explain the arrow of time. As Lagrange and Jacobi showed long ago, the plot against Newtonian time of the size of the end body system, its moment of inertia is, provided only the energy is non-negative, a curve that is concave upward, descending from an infinite value in the infinite past to a finite value at a Janus point before rising again to an infinite value in the infinite future. By the time reversal symmetry of Newton's equations, the behavior is qualitatively the same for either direction of Newtonian time. Much more interesting than the size, which in shape dynamics is unphysical gauge and is not plotted in this figure, is what the complexity does. It is here that quite novel statistical effects appear in shape dynamics. Thermodynamics grew out of the study of steam engines in which the working medium must be confined, otherwise the steam engine stops working. Matching that, statistical mechanics was developed in a conceptual box and accordingly restricted to dynamical systems with phase spaces of bounded Liouville measure. In contrast, the n-body problem is not in a box and lives in conventional terms in an infinite phase space. What happens there is quite different. In fact, at just one point in solutions of the n-body problem, the system is effectively in a box. It is at the Janus point at which there is no overall expansion. At this one point, a nominal size common to all possible initial data for all possible solutions can be specified. That effectively puts all the initial data in a box from which all solutions emerge with size steadily increasing relative to the nominal original size. Boltzmann's breakthrough to interpreting entropy as a count of microstates was that in the conceptual box, which he postulated and for sufficiently many particles, the great majority of states have a uniform spatial distribution and Maxwellian velocity distribution. He identified such states with thermal equilibrium states and showed they are vastly greater in number than all other states put together. By exactly the same argument, this must also be the case at just one instant, precisely at the Janus point, which necessarily exists in n-body solutions with non-negative energy. That includes zero energy as shape dynamics mandates. The figure taken from the paper Identification of a Gravitational Arrow of Time by Tim Koslovsky, Flavio Mercati and myself in 2014 shows the complexity increasing either side of the Janus point. On the left in the three body problem on the right in a simulation with a thousand particles. You cannot fail to see the bi-directional arrows of time. 
This behavior happens in every single solution. It is not a statistical effect revealed only in a Gibbs ensemble. Statistics is used only to prove that virtually all individual solutions look thermal at the Janus point. The principles of shape dynamics allows a theoretician, as I argued, to put a box there and there only with the same nominal size for all solutions. Outside the box, the size of the, solution, of the solutions is some ratio of the box size. Again, a ratio as allowed in shape dynamics. Internal observers who must necessarily be on the one or the other side of the genus point will find an arrow of time that does not appear to doom their universe to expire in heat death, but rather to indicate that if it emerged phoenix-like from the fire in order to progress to an increasingly ordered universe. This striking resemblance to the history of our own universe is a direct consequence of the shape dynamic approach. It overturns the conventional story. It is not entropy, but complexity that determines the direction of time. Moreover, it does it of direct di dynamical necessity not through an ill-defined past hypothesis. How, you will surely ask, is this to be reconciled with the long established facts of thermodynamics? They hold rigorously only in idealized, perfectly confined systems. But such things do not exist in the universe. They never have and never will. You see them in the figure either side of the Janus point in Flavio's artistic impression of evolution from effective thermal equilibrium at the Janus point. Those structures represent galaxies, stars, the earth, and even you and me, and in them, we are all subject to the laws of thermodynamics, but the universe is a different matter. What I've just discussed is only one of two ways to model of the universe. As a preparation for what follows, note that in the thousand body simulations in which the three body fluctuations are largely evened out, the complexity increases steadily and more or less uniformly with Newtonian time. Because the fluctuations can briefly reverse the increase, the complexity cannot be identified with time in a classical theory. Could it be that in a quantum theory of the universe, the complexity literally is time? Could it be shape dynamics trump car? One thing which suggests that it could is that the complexity has an absolute minimum, which could be identified with the birth of time and increases continuously to infinity. Something else that is very relevant comes from relaxation of a condition I mentioned that may not have seemed significant, namely that the moment of inertia, the size of the system remains finite at the Janus point. The argument for the overwhelming probability of thermal equilibrium at the Janus point relies critically on the size of that, of, uh, on the size of that point having a finite value. However, it has been known for over a century that certain remarkable solutions exist in the Newtonian end body problem in which all the particles collide at one instant at their center of mass. These solutions are called total collisions and of course 
at them, the Newtonian side of the system is zero. That has a profound effect. For example, N-body specialists have not been able to find any way of continuing such solutions in a unique manner and have concluded that Newton's equations break down at total collisions. Flavio and Paula Reichert have been looking at the possibility of continuation of such solutions in a shape dynamic set setting. And Flavio will be speaking about that in the first talk tomorrow. I'm going to consider the implications of the fact that whether or not a continuation exists, a Newtonian solution that leads to a total collision can, by time reversal symmetry, be transformed into a total explosion or Newtonian Big Bang. It is interesting that the existence of such solutions was known several decades before expansion of the universe was discovered. The profound effect, which is coupled with the requirement expected on Machian grounds of vanishing angular momentum of the system, is that the solutions all begin with a special shape called a central configuration. It can be either collinear or two or three dimensional, in which case the initial shapes are typically uniform, often remarkably so. In the case of three particles, the non-collinear total explosion solutions all begin equilateral. For four particles, one possible initial shape is the regular tetrahedron. In a central configuration, the force on each particle is directed toward the center of mass with strength proportional to the distance from it. If all particles are initially at rest in a central configuration, they will form fall homothetically without change of shape until they all collide at the center of mass. The much more interesting fact is that non-homothetic solutions in which the shape does change can terminate in a total collision, providing the final shape is a central configuration. Particularly interesting from the point of, sh of shape dynamics is that central configurations are extrema of the complexity, either the minimal or saddles that I mentioned. If the theory of time which I'm going to propose is on the right lines, these properties will have far reaching consequences. We can start with the nature of the minimum. As I said, the complexity has an absolute minimum. At it, the particle distribution is as uniform as it possibly can be. That's manifestly true for the equilateral triangle and regular tetrahedron in the three and four body cases. As the number of particles increases, the distribution becomes incredibly uniform. This was beautifully demonstrated early this century in a numerical study. The image in this slide on the left is a central configuration of 500 equal mass particles with complexity very near its absolute minimum. There are lots and lots of central configurations close to the absolute minimum. On the right, there is a section through it. Interestingly, the near perfect spherical symmetry and constant density that you see in the section is a manifestation of Newton's potential theorem. The complexity has many faces. Now comes my prime exhibit. Central configurations have been of great interest to mathematicians for about 120 years. Stephen Smale has called them a problem for the mathematics of the 21st century. 
For the last 20 or so years, numerical studies have been finding more and more central configurations. But until very recently, only for a few particles up to about 10, or as in this slide, only at or very near the complexity's absolute minimum. However, in the spring of this year, Manuel Esquerda, working with Alan Albuy at the observatory in Paris, started to find central configurations of 1,000 equal mass particles at somewhat higher values of the complexity. They are mostly in two dimensions, but the ones in three, which re require much more computing time, are similar. As you will now see, they reveal remarkable structure only hinted at previously in the numerical examples with up to 10 particles. Here on the left is a central configuration very close to the absolute minimum of the complexity. It is like the section in the previous slide, nearly exactly round with almost perfectly uniform density, except that in this case, the density decreases slightly going outwards. I think that is because of the difference between three and two dimensions. There is in both cases an abrupt end at the circular rim. The central configuration on the right with only marginally greater complexity, complexity as you see, exhibits remarkable voids and filaments. As of now, Manuel and Alain have not been able to find an explanation for their form and existence. They are surprisingly like the distribution of the galaxies in the universe in the present epoch. However, I do not want to suggest a direct connection. I'm more interested in other facts at the moment. The first is that there are a simply extraordinary number of such central configurations. Alain estimates their number at n factorial, where n is the number of particles. That is a staggering number. In fact, it is not even known if the number is finite. A major unresolved problem for over a century is whether there is a continuum of such solutions. Alain and a Russian collaborator have shown that there isn't for four particles in the plane and have almost proved the same for five particles. I will come back to some of the final, finer details of this image after I've discussed further the radical idea that quantum time is literally the complexity. In one sense, this idea, the idea is not radical. Bryce DeWitt recognized about 60 years ago that simple-minded canonical quantization of general relativity following the prescription that Dirac introduced leads to a wave function of the universe that is static. I think Bryce was the first to suggest that time in quantum gravity simply reflects correlations between different degrees of freedom within the universe. Many theoreticians have considered candidate possibilities. None has commanded wide assent. I am not aware of any proposal that a variable like the complexity should be time. Several things distinguish it. Among the candidates I know, it alone is a pure number. Second, it is, as I emphasized, many things at once, including intrinsic size. In fact, a common proposal for time in quantum gravity is the volume of a spatially closed universe. But in shape dynamics, that is a gauge variable, not a pure number. In contrast, the complexity is, as just 
reiterated the scale invariant intrinsic size of the universe. That seems to me better. Another argument for the complexity absent in all other proposals is that in the classical theory, <clears throat> it is the scale invariant quantity that not only as the shape potential defines the dynamics, but also as we have seen the direction of time. I think this is the place to extend ideas about scale invariant Planck units. Here is a proposal for a Planck time, again, of course, in scare quotes. A key property of the complexity is that it has an absolute minimum. Suppose that we have a shape with higher complexity, which we therefore say, Uh, which we therefore say has a later time and called now with an uppercase N, then the Planck time could have the form shown. It is zero at the minimum of the complexity or the absolute zero of the universe's variety and increases monotonically with the increasing value of the complexity you will see that it has the same form as the expression for the maximal possible efficiency of a steam engine, which is when the ambient temperature under which it operates is the absolute zero, and the complexity now is the temperature of the furnace. From this parallel with thermodynamics, it is a short step to Clausius's definition for the increment of entropy corresponding to the addition of, amount, of an amount of heat dq at the absolute temperature T. Here too, we have an inversion of thermodynamic orthodoxy. The increment in the complexity does not correspond to an increase of disorder, but of structure. This slide shows how I initially thought the complexity could be used as time in Newtonian quantum gravity, and hopefully it's Einsteinian generalization. I simply followed DeWitt in seeking an equation that governs a wave function of the universe, combining it with the long-standing belief that some dynamical equation which evolves an initial condition forward in time governs the universe. Suppose in this slide, the value of a wave function is specified on one of the contours of the complexity near the equilateral triangle. I propose the wave function to carry the value of the wave function forward at each point along the local gradient of the complexity to its higher values the Laplacian and gradient being determined by the natural metric. The aim was to determine probabilities jointly determined by the Born density and the, and the natural metric volume element. This being done for all shapes at successive values of the complexity identified as time. An intriguing, an intriguing aspect of this proposal is that a heuristic argument suggests the solution of the wave equation is unique and corresponds to a theory that in its basic structure is profoundly time asymmetric. This is a possibility Roger Penrose suggested long ago could be a defining feature of quantum gravity. My original proposal took a surprising turn when Flavio Mercati proposed an even simpler wave equation, also with a time asymmetric solution, but now with one of the simplest, ima of the simplest imaginable form, namely giving the same value of the Born density for all shapes with given value of the complexity. Tim immediately pointed out that such a theory would still make non-trivial predictions since the Born density and the measure jointly determine quantum probabilities. 
This means that even with constant born density, the measure which the natural metric supplies would still lead to non-trivial predictions. At each given complexity, all possible shapes with that complexity would have definite relative probabilities. I initially resisted this, but as a result of discussions with Sean Eccles and Joe Dunlop, who had spent some time trying to deduce what would be the consequences of my original proposal, I came to see virtues in what I had initially thought was too bizarre and counterintuitive. I will end my talk by pointing out some of the possibilities that seem to exist. The first observation is that the proposal to make complexity be time immediately means that all singularities that arise when particles get too close to each other are eliminated from the physics of the envisaged universe. The reason is very simple. By virtue of its definition, the complexity, at least as defined in the particle model, will automatically tend to infinity in such a situation. But since the complexity is time, such an event is pushed away to the infinite future. It can never be experienced at finite time. I'm not at all knowledgeable about quantum field theory, but ultraviolet singularities are certainly a major issue with which it has to contend. Could it be that shape dynamics simply banishes them in this simple way? I think Tim is planning to say something about this in the final talk tomorrow. The next striking fact is another manifestation of the role of statistics in shape dynamics. Let's look again at Manuel's two figures, together with two more that I will discuss in a moment, and consider the possible ways in which the complexity of the minimal complexity shape top, top left can be increased. The simplest way to do that is just to move two particles closer to each other. By this device, we will create a shape that won't be a central configuration, but will have the same complexity as the shape bottom left. However, its structure will be utterly boring compared with that of the central configuration. Such a configuration will also violate the cosmological Copernican principle. There will be a distinguished point or region within it. Of course, the Copernican principle is violated by the existence of the center of mass of the particles and the edge of the central configurations. I do not think this is a fatal, this is fatal because it may be possible to create a similar model in a three-dimensional spherical space analogous to the two-dimensional surface of the Earth. One thing at least is already clear in this figure. There are vastly more ways to increase the complexity of the shape top left by innumerable small changes that can be made to all the interparticle separations than by adjusting only a few. The near minimal complexity shape top left, whose analog in a closed three-dimensional space should, I believe, satisfy the Copernican principle, cosmologist touchstone almost perfectly, will be transformed in virtually all cases into ones that satisfy the principle equally well there are only relatively few of them, all close in shape space to the central configuration bottom left, will approximate its fascinating structure. It is also very interesting to see the manner in which, despite its beautiful voids and filaments, it manifests long range order. Take disks with diameter that is say, 
one tenth of the full disk of the central configuration. Place such a disk at random somewhere on the full disk. What you find wherever you place the disk, except of course at the edge, is much the same as what you will find anywhere else. That's a manifestation of something very important in cosmology called long range order. One of the most important significant facts in cosmology is that throughout its entire existence, it has exhibited long range order together with fulfillment of the Copernican principle. I suspect the great bulk of all shapes with any given complexity and sufficiently many particles will satisfy the Copernican principle. This brings me to the figure top right, top right taken from a paper by Michael Joyce and collaborators. Its complexity for the same number of particles is certainly greater than the minimal value of the one top left. And I'm pretty sure it is also less than the complexity of the central configuration bottom left. It has a so-called glassy distribution. The universe, uh, like that of molecules of glass, the universe had a matter distribution rather like that, as far back as cosmological theory and observations can determine. The glassy distribution is at least qualitatively like the famous Harrison Zeldovich type fluctuations when they are represented not in Fourier space, but in real space. The, dis the distribution top right gives an idea of what the universe looked like before it thermalized and gave rise to the observed microwave background. The widely acknowledged success of inflation is its ability to suggest a quantum, to suggest a quant that quantum mechanics could have generated such fluctuations. At this very preliminary stage in the exploration of the shape dynamics inspired idea that complexity is time, the history of the universe that is beginning to appear is that at the birth of time, the universe looked like the very near, nearly minimal complexity shape top left, or more realistically, the one in three dimensions that I showed earlier. Somewhat later, the great bulk of the possible shapes looked glassy, with among them the occasional central configuration at certain discrete values of the complexity. Such central configurations necessarily have a pen penumbra of shapes that look much the same many with exactly the same complexity and others with slightly lesser and greater complexity. A kind of distribution through which our universe does seem to have passed, does never seem to have passed, is the Poisson distribution shown bottom right. But I think that could be something like the typical thermal distribution I suggested should be typical at the Janus point of a universe with bi-directional arrows of time. It is time for me to end. I will do that with a hint that quantum mechanics might emerge directly from the principles of shape dynamics, for which I show once more Manuel's two images. I pointed out that a simple probability argument proves that the great bulk of the shapes just above the absolute minimum of the complexity will come about through many small changes within it of the interparticle separations. Since, at least in the case of equal mass particles, the smallest separations are, as you see on the left, and saw better without the gradual density decrease in the earlier three dimensional central configuration almost all exactly the same. This will be true for the great bulk of the shapes with slightly higher complexity. You see this confirmed in Manuel's central configuration on the right. Look at it carefully.
the smallest separations are nearly all the same. Perhaps the greatest single step in the discovery of quantum mechanics was Bohr's proposal that angular momentum of the electron in the hydrogen atom must be quantized in units of Planck's constant. At a stroke, this explained why the electron does not fall into the proton. Is it possible that we see a deeper explanation here? At any given complexity, for purely statistical reasons, virtually all the smallest separations will be the same. You won't find any coincident particles. Tim will talk about an interesting development of this idea tomorrow. In it, the number of particles is allowed to increase. This still allows time to be complexity and increase with it because the complexity depends both on the number of particles and their relative disposition. I think this latest proposal, which is Tim's, is freighted with possibilities. To summarize my main points, the principles of shape dynamics are simple and founded on unity of the universe. Denial that there exists a ruler outside it mandates scale invariance. This inverts the second law of thermodynamics. Evolution from a state with interesting structure to dull uniformity is replaced by its opposite, ongoing creation of interest. Thank you. Thank you very much, Julian. Thank you. Bit chaotic, I'm afraid. <laughs> Thank you very much. I think that was a very clear and very nice talk. <clears throat> so, right, then um, I'd like to open this up for um, questions. So we take about 15 minutes, I think. So please raise your hands if you have a question and then you can ask it. We raise them physically or in the chat? Um, um, if you raise the answer. hand, in the, in, I okay. can call you. <laughs> okay, so Flavio, you can ask the first question. Hi, Julian. Hi, Flavio. Hello. Um, so <clears throat> I was wondering if you could uh, uh, comment on uh, the issue of uh, complex numbers, because uh, uh, I, I suppose you're, you're just assuming that the wave function will be complex in uh, your latest proposal. Uh, but there is also space for rethinking that people have been uh, wondering about uh, a, uh, the wheeler the equation that is uh, real and uh, doesn't need to lead to a complex solution. Uh, and we always assume that uh, in order to get quantum interference and all the interesting uh, quantum effects, we need a uh, complex wave function, but that's not obvious uh, to me. And since we are in such a uh, uh, unusual uh, framework here, perhaps there's space for rethinking that too. Uh, can you comment on that? Yes, yeah, yeah, certainly. Obviously, uh, complex numbers is a huge uh, thing, Flavia. Uh, long ago, back in the mid 90s, I pointed out that at least the simplest form of the Wheeler DeWitt equation is real, and that all the attempts to recover complex quantum mechanics from it were actually bogus because they put it in by hand at the start because they assumed they assumed a wave function in the form of the of a wave WKB solution. So th there's certainly a major issue coming in in quantum gravity there, which has not been sufficiently recognised. Um, my, I mean, it's I mean, it's quite clear that uh, a complex Hilbert space is is manifested in all the local uh, 
things about quantum mechanics observed in, in the laboratory. I mean, this, this, I mean, this is just undeniable. My, my suspicion is that the quantum, that there's a quantum mechanics of the universe and out of it, the quantum mechanics that we observe in the laboratory emerges. There's, there's a close analogy with, there's a partial analogy at least with this, just in purely classical mechanics, um, math, um, mechanics. If you have a Machian universe, it must have vanishing energy and vanishing angular momentum. But as soon, uh, and that's described by a constrained Hamiltonian dynamics. But once you get away from the Janus point or from a big bang, uh, subsystems form and they can have all values of the energy and angular momentum and they are described by proper Hamiltonian dynamics. So the, the, the type of law that's governing the system changes when subsystems form. And I, my own suspicion is that this is what is happening in, in, in quantum, uh, in quantum will, should happen with quantum mechanics. I think it's also possible this particle model we've been using is, is absolutely the simplest you can possibly imagine. It's just point particles. But if we say that spatial scale and the similarity group is what governs everything, then I think it's entirely possible that you could enrich the definition of shape space because after all, spinors, uh, which exist in three-dimensional space and Cartan discovered them in 1913, before, long before Dirac found them in, in quantum mechanics. Um, I would say they are bona fide three-dimensional spatial structures and possibly one could modify the structure of of a shape space with particles to include such features. So that's my best hope. But I mean, clearly, if we're on the right track, I think there's still several really major steps to be made before we get there. Thank you. Thank you. So Dustin, uh, please ask the next question. Yes, so first of all, thank you very much for the marvelous talk. It was really beautiful and very inspiring. Um, I have a question regarding the shape complexity. So um, I tend to think about it, although that might be the wrong way to do it, as a sort of macro variable. And um, one th point that then concerns me is that it's very sensitive to, I mean, it could be dominated by a single particle escaping to infinity relative to the other. So by a single pair of uh, particles, uh, you know, nearly colliding. Um, is, is that a behavior that, yeah, is it appropriate for what the shape complexity is supposed to, to do and represent that it's so sensitive to, to single, single particles, so to speak? Uh, in fact, I think that's, that's a point I did make, which I think is actually a potentially a great virtue, is yeah. that uh, it, it is very easy, as you say, with a single particle to make the complexity become as, close, as, as large as you like. It can go to infinity. Right. Um, and um, and th th on the face of it, you're quite right. But the other thing, then the point is, because if you say the complexity is time, then that's in the infinite future. It'll never happen. So this is this is the point that I make. It this I mean it, it sounds absolutely outrageous. Given I mean ever since whenever it, when were all the problems with the infinities in quantum field theory discovered in the nineteen thirties. I mean, high energy physics has been struggling with infinities for ninety years or something, eighty or ninety years. Right. Here am I suggesting just look at complexity. <laughs> it might solve all the problems just like that. It'll okay. never happen. That's in the distant future. We'll never experience it. I don't know. I mean, it's just so ridiculous. It'll be fun if it's right. <laughs> right. Okay, thank you. Uh, Sorry, can way, I, can I intervene? Yeah. Oh, Flavia, do you want to come in first? Yes. Yes, just a, a mini comment. I, actually, uh, it's a provocation, eh? but if you think about it, physicists uh, are trying to uh, smash particles as close as possible for uh, since at least we have particle accelerators and it's hard. So maybe <laughs> that's why. 
or it has something to do with it. I don't know. It's, it's just a provocation, but uh, uh, you see where I'm going. Yeah, yeah. It might have something to do with it. Uh, and it might. Well, we, we, could, we could talk about that later, possibly. Come back with that, with the Large Hadron Collider, perhaps a little bit. But let me carry on and just say, to with regard to the original question, I think there is a considerable case for looking for other quantities that characterize a given shape. Uh, the In statistical mechanics, the total energy is the main state function that you consider. So you, you, that you, you have state functions in statistical mechanics. So I would say that in, in cosmology guided by shape dynamics, the principal state function is precisely the complexity. But then in statistical mechanics, there are other very useful state functions like the magnetization and things like that. Now, one thing I think is that you could possibly look at something like the Shannon entropy, where you would define a Shannon entropy by uh, how many part by sort of discretizing the distances, the relative distances between the shapes, and uh, so you would have show you would say that you would divide the greatest distances into a hundred parts, and then in all of those one hundred bins that you could then create, you could put all the shapes that that are one hundredths to two one hundredths and so forth. And then from that, you could calculate a Shannon type entropy. And I think it would be very interesting because either the maximum or the minimum of that Shannon type entropy, I think, would would actually correspond to pretty uninteresting shapes. And I suspect the most interesting shapes would be the ones where the Shannon entropy is somewhere in the in the middle in the middle. So I think there are interesting possibilities for looking for further uh, state functions. Yeah, okay. that sounds, that sounds very intriguing. It's also, um, you know, many people have speculated that um, there's some sort of, I think Scott Aronson also coined the term, the first law of complexodynamics or something like that, speculating that, um, uh, in, in, that there's some sort of rule or, or general regularity that uh, at, at medium entropy systems are the most interesting, but I don't think anyone has been able to make it to make it precise yet. Maybe that's uh, something. Well, 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 maybe starting with our. Uh, I mean, I, I I don't know. I mean, I have I've met Scott at a, a FQXI conference. I don't know whether he's sort of aware of complexity or something like that. I think it's something that we've, I, th I think us and end body specialists are the only people really who have taken much interest in, in complexity or, or they call it the shape potential or the normalized Newton potential. Uh, let me, if I may go back to Flavio's comment, uh, only a few days ago, I watched a, a talk by Nima Akali Ahmed who has this remarkable thing with the amplitohedron where they calculate scattering amplitudes. And one thing that I found very striking about that is that they, uh, they always, they, they claim that the only well-defined uh, quantum states are ones that are asymptotic, the, the sort of where you have incoming states uh, and, and then you have uh, collisions. And he, he was showing a slide with, with a collision at the, at the I mean, it was a, just a sketch of, a, of such a collision at the Large Hadron Collider. Um, and so this, this approach with the amplitohedron, which is generating quite a lot of excitement, um, relies very much on these atom asymptotic states and, and uh, collisions. And this relates to, to Flavio's comment about what's happening at the Large Hadron Collider. Now, I'm just wondering whether that is right um, and, and whether this comes from, one is just so used to thinking about the Large Hadron Collider and what you can do with it, that you're not thinking at it from a whole universe point of view. So I think, I mean, he has a picture of, of of the Large Hadron Collider straddling Switzerland and France, and then sort of yellow sparks coming out where two things have collided. 
but I'm not sure that that's the right way to think about the universe at all. Um, I, I think uh, there may be another way that, that uh, in fact, you could look at, you saw one of those shapes that, that, uh, that have been calculated. I mean, I mean, a good one would be the one that Manuel calculated with those extraordinary voids and filaments. And in fact, you could just take a fraction of, of that and it would actually look like that scattering event that uh, Akadi Harman, uh, Nima Akadi, I'm going to call him Nima, but it's, it's too much to get the whole name, uh, that Nima was showing uh, with just the scattering bit that maybe, maybe that's the way we should think about scattering events and completely forget about these asymptotic states.